All right, I'm going to ask you, you would to turn with me to the book of Psalms tonight, chapter number 20. Psalms chapter number, excuse me, Psalms chapter 19. Psalms chapter 19. I want you to turn there with me and we'll be reading verses 7 through 11 in just a moment. Psalms chapter number 19, verses 7 through 11. I want to talk to you for a little while tonight about earthly rewards for present obedience. Earthly rewards for present obedience. Psalms 19, beginning in verse number 7. The Bible says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than fine, much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. Notice the words, the last words in this verse. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. Let me read that verse again. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. Present rewards, earthly rewards for obedient living. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for the truth that's set before us tonight. Help me now, Lord, as I try to share some very simple thoughts with your people tonight. Use the truth of your word to stir hearts, challenge hearts, and convict hearts where convictions need. We'll praise you, Lord, for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Normally when the subject of rewards in the Christian life are brought up, first thing that comes to our mind is eternity. Because in our minds we're thinking that the reward for Christian living lies in eternity. Let, let me stop there for a minute and say to you that salvation is not the reward for living a Christian life. Salvation is a gift of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is not a reward. Salvation is God's love gift to us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about something beyond our salvation tonight. We're talking about, we're talking about how God is going to reward His children. And, and as I said, most of the time when we think about being rewarded, we, we think about life beyond today. We think about life in eternity. As the old black preacher used to say, pie in the sky by and by. Thinking about, thinking about rewarded after we leave this world. Well now the Bible does teach us that there be rewards in the afterlife for those who have faithfully served the Lord. But God also promises earthly rewards right now, in the here and now, to those who have kept His commandments, those who are living in obedience to His Word. I know and you know sadly tonight there are some uh, Christians who live disobedient lives and, and possibly all of us fall into that category from time to time. But others are obedient. And if and as and when we obey the Lord... The Lord promises us a rich reward. In fact, if you look here in verse 11, at the last two words, He says a great reward. You ought to underline that. A great reward. And in keeping of them, what's He talking about? What He's been talking about in all these verses, beginning back up in number, verse number 7. He's talking about the commandments of the Lord, the law of the Lord. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. Now, the reference here is not primarily to future rewards that we're going to receive at the judgment seat of Christ, but to rewards that 
we receive here and now in this world. Yes, one day as, as believers, we are all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That word judgment seat of Christ comes from a Greek word that, uh, that speaks about the Bema seat. When Paul, when Paul talks about the judgment seat, uh, those he was speaking to would immediately identify, because he was using that term, Bema seat, he, they would immediately identify that uh, with the place where judges stood during the uh, uh, Olympic Games to judge those who were participating in those games. And they would hand down uh, blue ribbons or gold medals. We think about gold medals with Olympics today, but they would hand down rewards for that. And he tells us as believers, we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, and we're either going to we're either going to be rewarded or we're going to suffer loss, determined by how faithful we have been in our Christian lives. In fact, if you will turn over with me in your Bible, you want to might want to mark this passage in First Corinthians chapter three, verse number nine. Uh, of this third chapter of 1 Corinthians. Paul said, we're laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth their own. But let every man take heed how he buildeth their own. For the foundation can no man lay than that it uh, lay than that uh, is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he have built thereon, he shall re re receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. If you move on over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, Paul adds to that thought when he tells us we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. I'd encourage you as a Christian to spend some time looking closely at the teaching of God's Word concerning the judgment seat of Christ. And if you'll do that, you're going to quickly realize that, that, that as a believer, you, you have not been given a license to sin. For years, uh, people have criticized Baptists for their, their belief about the security of the believer and, and, and said to them, well, that's nothing more than a license to sin, to live like you want to live. Well, listen, the grace of God in our lives is not a license to sin. We're going to have to give an account to God for our faithfulness or the lack thereof as believers at the judgment seat of Christ. And there will be a gain to be realized or there will be a loss to be recognized when we stand before him. But in our text tonight, here in Psalms chapter 19, the Bible speaks of a reward for obedience that is to be received and enjoyed in this present life. Now, there are a couple of words I want, I want you to notice in this 11th verse uh, and the last part of the verse that, that, that really open our understanding there, the word in and the word is. And in, that's present time, as we keep his commandments now, and in keeping of them, there is, again, that's present time, there is great reward. And so the Bible is telling us here that, that what the word of God is, is, is saying to us is that in the actual process of doing God's will, in the process of keeping God's commandments in this life, there is great reward. If we obey God, we'll be rewarded in this very act of obedience. There are three things that I, I want to just sort of lift out here as we think about uh, these uh, earthly rewards for present obedience tonight and, and talk about them for a moment. I want us to begin First of all, by taking a, a close look at the commandments of the Lord. The, the writer of this uh, 19th Psalm, uh, most likely David, uh, gives us some insight concerning uh, the commandments of the Lord. 
uh, he, he, he helps us to understand the, 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 the potency of the characteristics of the commandments, the, the, the power uh, uh, of the characteristics of God's commandments. And uh, seven things uh, he gives us here in these verses uh, telling us about uh, the, the powerful commandments of the Lord. Uh, truths that are contained in the Bible, what, what they can accomplish in our lives. He, he begins by stressing the importance of how powerful they are. Look in verse 7 at what he says. The law of the Lord is perfect. Notice these next words, converting the soul. Do you know what that tells us? The, the word of God is, is God's power in this world to change the life of a man. I can't change a man's life. We, we have seen the incapability of man in our world uh, to change the lives of people who were living uh, unprofitable lives. We see it in our prison system. Our, our prison systems are running over, people sleeping on the floor and, and everything else. And, and they're going and coming. The, the doors are almost revolving doors as they come and go in and out of the prison system. Why? Because their lives are not being changed. There's but one thing that will change a man's life, and that's the Word of God. God's Word is the instrument that he uses to change or to turn men and women from darkness to life, from Satan to himself. Over in Acts chapter 26 and verse 28, King Agrippa, uh, Paul is there before King Agrippa, and uh, he's heard Paul has, has preached, he's testified, preached, whatever you want to call it, uh, to King Agrippa, and, and, and Agrippa makes this statement, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What he's saying is the word that you have given me has moved me so greatly that almost you have persuade, persuaded me to be a Christian. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul, talking about the believers in the Thessalonian church, uh, he said how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. How did that come about? It came about by the preaching of the Word of God, by the truth of God's Word. It was God's Word that converted their souls, that changed their lives. What a powerful instrument God's Word is. In fact, it is more powerful than an atomic bomb. You can't change a person's life with the atomic bomb. You can eradicate it from, from this world, but you can't change a person's life with the atomic bomb. But with the Word of God, a person's life can be changed. Paul said in Ephesians, excuse me, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not only are his commandments powerful, but they're plain. Look, look at verse 7 again. He says, making wise the simple. He's talking about the law of the Lord. Now look back at it again. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God's word is plain. I don't, I don't know if you've had occasion to do this, but uh, if you've ever had occasion to look at some of the laws that our politicians draw up, they're certainly not plain. They're certainly not simple. When politicians draw laws, uh, draft laws up, they're so complicated that, that sometimes even other lawyers and even judges can't understand what they're trying to say. And uh, oftentimes they have to uh, carry those laws all the way to the Supreme Court where, where nine justices have to pour over those things for months and months trying to get an understanding of what they're trying to say. But the Word of God tells us here that, that the Word of God is plain, making wise the simple. What he's saying is that the commands of the Lord are so clear, they're so plain, that the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not be in any doubt uh, about them. Over in Isaiah 35 and verse 8, uh, as Isaiah is speaking of God's word, he says, And a highway shall be there in a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. 
His, uh, His commandments are plain. His commandments are powerful. But then thirdly, they're pleasing. Look at, look at verse number 8. The statutes of the Lord are, re are right, rejoicing the heart. God's, God's word is pleasing. There, there, there's nothing more pleasing in your life than as a child of God partaking of the word of God and living according to its precepts. I run across people and have through the years who have the idea that God's will and God's way is something that is restricting, something that is hard, something that, that can be even painful in your life. But, but how untrue that is. There's nothing more liberating in this world than the Word of God. In Romans 12 and verse 2, Paul said, Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. John tells us in 1 John 5 and verse 3 that his commandments are not grievous. That word grievous means burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. They're not, they're not grievous. And, uh, they're not heavy. In fact, uh, uh, the commandments of the Lord lighten the load rather than making it heavy. I don't know a heavier load to carry than the load of guilt in a person's life. And the Word of God will remove that guilt as we bring ourselves into a place of obedience to that Word. So His commandments are powerful. They're plain. They're pleasing. And then fourthly, they're pure. Look at verse 8 again. He said, the commandment of the Lord is pure. The word pure there means exactly what it says. Pure. There's no mixture of evil in the Word of God. Men draw laws. Men, men draft laws. And oftentimes, when men draft laws, they have an, uh, an underlying agenda behind what they're doing, but not so with the Word of God. God's commandments are, are holy like God Himself. So His commandments are powerful. They're plain. They're pleasing. They're pure. And then number five, they're permanent. Look at verse number nine. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. They endure forever. God's Word never goes out of date. Never has to be revised. Never has to be renewed. Uh, His commandments are, 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 are permanent. They, 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 they're appropriate. They're applicable in every age, in every circumstance. In Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. And God's law, God's commandments are permanent. God hadn't changed His mind about anything that He said. From the very day that He said it, the very time that He gave it to those who pinned it down, God has not changed His mind. Uh, he has not, uh, you've heard the term, if you've listened to the news for the last several days, you've heard the term flip-flop. Politicians do a good job at flip-flopping. Uh, they, 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 they get out and, and they, uh, they, they, they wet their political finger in their mouth and they stick it up and whichever the way the wind's blowing, that's the way they, that's the way they go. But I want to tell you something. God hadn't changed his mind about what he meant and, and what he said. His, his, his commandments are permanent. They're powerful. They're plain. They're pleasing. They're pure. But then they're precious. Look at verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. For that one who is a true believer, that one who is truly saved, Jesus is precious. Just the mention of the name of Jesus is precious to that heart. First Peter 2 and verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe is he precious. Not only is Jesus precious, but His blood is precious. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. And then along with that, His Word is precious. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 4 talks about precious promises. So, His commandments are precious to the child of God. That They have found, that they have found something there that they cannot find anywhere else. In all of culture, in all the world. And God's Word is precious to them. And then lastly, his commandments are preventative. Look, look at verse number 11. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. 
The Word of God will keep you from sin. Or, or as uh, D.L. Moody said, sin will keep you from the Word of God. I, I don't know how you are, but I've learned a long time ago, ago that prevention is far better than the cure. Preventing trouble in, in my life is a lot better than, than dealing with the cure for it. And God's desire is to prevent us from sinning and grieving Him. And, and, and because of that, He's given us His commands. How wonderful God's commandments are. How right the psalmist is to speak of them as being perfect. There, Listen, if you want to look for something perfect in this world, you don't have to look any further than these 66 books because they're perfect. The commandments of the Lord. But then secondly, I want you to notice here, not only, not only the powerful characteristics of God's Word, but I want you to notice the pleasant rewards of keeping His commandments. Along with there being seven very powerful characteristics of His commandments, uh, the psalmist gives us here seven pleasant rewards that come to our lives here not yonder in heaven, not after we walk through, through the, 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 the golden gate into, into heaven, but seven pleasant rewards here as we keep his commandments. Let, let me give you some verses. First of all, there's long life. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 46 and 47, the Lord said to his people, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it's not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. And through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. God said, I'm giving you my word, and, and, and uh, your obedience to my word is going to prolong your days in the land that I'm giving you. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, My son, forget not thy law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. I, I think the message is very clear uh, from God's word. If, if we seek to live within the realm of God's will and obey His laws, then our days are going to be lengthened. If we break His laws and we're careless and we're intemperate and we, we, we live self-led lives, then what we're doing is shortening our days. I know people who have done that. You know people who have done that. If you desire to live a long life, live for the Lord. Secondly, not only the reward of a long life, but the reward of protection. In Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 5, the Bible says, Whoso keepeth the commandments shall feel no evil thing. God said, You live by my word, and, and I will protect you. Now, that, do, that doesn't mean that, that nothing will ever go wrong in my life or in your life. Get, get it out of your mind that because you've got an ache in your big toe, it must be sin in your life. Or, or, or because uh, so-and-so has, has uh, uh, had an append uh, appendicitis attack that, that there must be sin. No, friend, listen. Uh, th things, uh, good things and bad things happen to all of us in this life. That, that's the journey of life in this world. What, what, it, what it does mean is that if we're living according to the commandments of the Lord, in all the experiences of life, whether they're good experiences or bad experiences, we're going we're to experience the reality of Romans 8, 28. And we're going to know that, that all things work together. Not, not all good things, but all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. It is a fact that sorrow is going to come in my life. It has. It is a fact that trials are going to come in my life. They have. It is a fact that testing is going to come in my life. And it has. But if I'm living according to the Word of God, um, the Word of God is promising me that God's hand will never, never allow evil, will never be evil, but it will always be good in my life. I, I can be assured of God's protective hand in my life if I'm living according to to the Word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter number 23 and verse 5, the Lord promised Israel that because of their obedience and faithfulness that He would turn even their being cursed into a blessing. 
the reward of long life, the reward of protection. Then, thirdly, there's a reward of gladness. The most joyful people that I know in this world are people who are constantly seeking to live by the Word of God, constantly seeking to please the Lord. They're looking for opportunities in their life to live a pleasing life. First Chronicles 16 and verse 27. Glory and honor are in His presence. Strength and gladness are in His place. Over in the early, early verses of the book of Acts, as the new church, first century church, is literally beginning. In Acts 2, verse 42 and 46, we can see that reward at work in the lives of God's people in that first century church. Verse 42 talks about how they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Verse 46 says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Because of their living in obedience to God's word, there was gladness in their life. They didn't get up in the morning concerned about whether they were going to face the judgment of God in their life because they weren't living for the Lord. I don't know of any m more miserable life to live than, than a life like that. Wondering whether I'm uh, wondering, uh, is God's judgment going to be on my life today because I haven't lived like I ought to for Him? The reward of long life, the reward of protection, the reward of gladness, the reward of great peace. Psalms 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The word offend there means uh, obstacle or, or stumbling block. No, nothing will cause them to stumble in their life. They're not going to be offended. They're not going to be easily offended in their life. What a, what a priceless reward that is. To, to have peace even in this world of trouble and, and disturbance and alarm and fear and war, not, not knowing from one moment to the next where things are and, and what is going to take place in the days ahead. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. One of my favorite verses, and I, I've quoted it so many times to folks in times of, of great distress. I remember... Brother Wilbur Hurt. I don't know how many times I heard Brother Hurt quote this verse. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Fox News. No. Whose mind is stayed on CNN. No. ABC. No. NBC. No. Whose mind is stayed on thee. Whose mind is going to enjoy perfect peace that individual whose mind is stayed on the Lord. Why? Because he trusteth in thee. Listen, I, I don't know what's going to happen in this election. I, I'm, about as, I'm about as stirred up about it as you are. But I want to tell you what I do know is going to come about in the end of this. God's still going to be in control. God will still have the upper hand. Listen, God will never lose the upper hand. Whether Democrats are in control or Republicans are in control, God will still have the upper hand. And if I want to have peace in the midst of all this, and you want to have peace in the midst of all this, it's, it can only come as we trust in the Lord. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 are some great verses to write down. And when you find yourself struggling emotionally, Go to those verses. They'll do more for you than uh, finding you a, a psychiatrist somewhere who's hung a shingle out and going in to talk to him. Most of the time, if, if they're not saved, all they're going to try to get you to do is blame all your trouble on, on your parents or your husband or your wife or somebody else. But if you really want some emotional help, go to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. We're talking about... We're, we're talking about... Rewards. We're talking about present rewards for present obedience. Earthly rewards. Think, I don't have to wait to heaven uh, to, uh, to, uh, till I get to heaven to enjoy these things. The Lord said I can have great peace. I, listen, I know He's going to be in charge in heaven, but I don't have to wait till I get to heaven to rest in that. I can rest in that right now as I obey the Word of God. Great peace, He says. 
Long life, protection, gladness. And then there's assurance of salvation. I, I wish I'd kept a diary through the years uh, of things that, troubles that people had come to me with. I, I could not tell you how many folks have come to me struggling with assurance of their salvation. I'm talking about people who've been in church 25, 30 years struggling with assurance in their life. Well, I want you to know that's not God's desire for any of His children. God never desired for you to have one moment of doubt in your life. I, I know preachers who, who have uh, literally developed a ministry of bringing doubt into people's life and, and, and they'll preach and get, get people under a cloud of doubt and fill up the altar and talk about how people got delivered. Well, it never has been God's desire to bring doubt into your life. God's desire is that I be sure of my salvation. God's desire is that, that, that I know that I am eternally saved, that, I'm, that, that, uh, that, that in, in Christ Jesus I am secure. In Colossians 3 and verse 3, Paul said, For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. As long as God's alive, I'm alive. Because I'm in Him. 1 John 3 and verse 24, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. As long as God's alive, I don't have to fret over whether or not I'm secure. Because I'm secure in Him. Because I'm in Him. Number six there is the reward of answer to prayers. 1 John 3 and verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments. And do those things that are pleasing to Him. He didn't say in whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him no matter how we live. That's not what He says. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments. Are you struggling? Are you struggling to have your prayers answered? Have you checked up on whether or not you're living according to His Word? If we seek to obey God, He promises to hear us and to answer our prayers. And then lastly, there's the, the reward of His conscious presence. The conscious presence of Christ. Being aware that He's there. How long since you sensed the conscious presence of the Lord? Listen to what Jesus said in John 14 and verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. He didn't just have a King James Bible with 66 books. He that hath my commandments. He just got the Word of God. And then He adds on to it and keepeth it. He it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. That word manifest means to exhibit, to disclose himself. The Lord is saying, if you've got my word and you're keeping my word, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manifest myself to you. I'm going to exhibit my, you're, you're going to sense my presence. That word manifest is such a key word in that verse. It is true that the Lord's always with us. If we're saved, He's always with us. He, he promised never to leave us nor forsake us. It is, it is true from the Word of God that where two or three are gathered in His name, that He's there. The Lord is here tonight. He's in this place. But I want to tell you there's a whole lot of difference between the promise of God and His being here and you and I Understanding and realizing His presence. His, he, making Himself consciously present in our lives. And He's promised to do that if we'll obey His Word. All right, we talked about the potent characteristics of His commandments and the pleasant rewards of His commandments. And I'm through. But let me, let me talk to you for just a minute about the practical keeping of His commandments. What does it mean to keep His commandments? Let me, give you, let me give you five simple things that it means. And I'll just give them to you and leave them with you. First of all, it means seeking them. You can't, you can't obey them if you don't know them. 
You, you can't obey them until, until you find them. What that means is you're going to have to spend time in the Word of God. You, you can't ignore that. You can't, escape, you can't escape the fact of that. And we can only find them by seeking them. In 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 8, the Lord instructed Israel to keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God. So keeping His commandments, first of all, means seeking them. Secondly, it means seeking them all. 1 Chronicles 28, 8, keep and seek for all, he said. You, you see, his commandments are not open to pick and choose from. I, I, I can't say, well, I'm not going to be a thief and then turn right around and become an alcoholic. I, I can't say I'm not going to be an alcoholic and, and turn right around and be an adulterer. I, I can't pick and choose from the Word of God. I've got to obey everything in the Word of God. So, so, practically keeping his commandments seek, means seeking them first of all. Second, that means seeking all of them. And thirdly, it means obeying them. Not only are we to find them, not only are we to understand what they mean, but then we're to put them into practice in our lives. We're to obey them. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, the very first question that Saul of Tarsus asked when he was saved was this, Lord, what will thou have me to do? The true child of God, somebody who wants to please the Lord, somebody wants to, who wants to have the blessing and the reward on their, on their life right now, that ought to be a question, Lord, what would you have me do? James 1.22, we've heard quoted time and time again. We don't need to just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Keeping his commandments involves seeking them, seeking them all, obeying them. And then, number four, it means obeying them promptly. Psalms 119, verse 60, the psalmist said, I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Well, we're just making a real mess out of our lives when we know what the Word of God says and then we disobey. We're, we're, we're taunting the Lord. We're tempting the Lord to judge our lives, literally, when we do that. And then lastly, the keeping of His commandments means delighting in obeying them. Psalms 112, verse 1, the psalmist said, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. I read that verse out of 1 John 5 and verse 3 a little while ago that says his commandments are not grievous. Remember the words of Jesus there in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So often when we think about obeying God's Word, we think of something that is so hard, something that's going to be so painful in our lives. Earthly rewards for present obedience. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29, the Lord said of His people Israel, Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear Me and keep all My commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. I wonder how often the Lord looks down on us today and says the very same thing about us that He said about the children of Israel. Things would be so much different in their lives. Life would be, so, life would be such a pleasing thing if they would only obey my word. Back in the early 1900s, Frank Hudson wrote a song. It pays to serve Jesus. Now, I'm going to finish up reading the words of his song tonight because it's so good. The service of Jesus, true pleasure affords. In him there's joy without an alloy. Tis heaven to trust him and rest on his words. It pays to serve Jesus whatever may be tied. It pays to be true whatever you may do. Tis riches of mercy in him to abide. It pays to serve Jesus each day. 
Though sometimes the shadows may hang o'er the way and sorrows may come to beckon us home, our precious Redeemer each toil will repay. It pays to serve Jesus each day. It pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day. It pays every step of the way. Though the pathway to glory may sometimes be drear, you'll be happy each step of the way. You want to be happy in your Christian life? Then get in the place of obedience because it's only in that place that you're going to find true happiness as a child of God. Bow your head with me, please, if you would. Mr. Janet, if you come and, and just play a verse of an invitation song tonight. Maybe in this room tonight, uh, you've been struggling in your Christian life and wondering why in the world am I having such a dreary time? Why am I struggling so? It might very well lie in the very thing we've talked about tonight. It's not that you don't know what God's Word says. It's that you do know what God's Word says and you haven't been faithful. Lord, thank you for the truth of your Word. Now I pray that you'd help that one who has need in their life tonight to say yes to you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Stand with me, please. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed for just a moment.